Hi everybody, good to be with you all today. Hope you're doing well. So thank you Pam for that lively introduction. And I enjoy getting those newsletters every week too. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the 35th slogan. And an interesting aspect of it is, uh, is to work with sympathetic joy, which is one of the four immeasurables. So I'm going to spend time on the slogan after we meditate and also spend some time on the four immeasurables because sympathetic joy as well as compassion, love or loving kindness and equanimity are all those four. Uh, I'll go over that a little later in more detail. How's my sound? Is everything okay? Okay, great. And so uh, what I thought we would do tonight, I'm very excited, is guide you through a sympathetic joy meditation practice as kind of developed um, by Lama Tsultram Alioni, one of my mentors, um, inspired by the teachings of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And she has these meditations for each of the four measurables. So I thought we could also go through the other ones as the weeks and months unfold too. But uh, I want to guide you through sympathetic joy. We'll start with some shamatha. And then I'll guide you through a practice that's not unlike Tonglen. But instead of doing Tonglen, we'll do um, a slightly different practice. Uh, cultivating joy. Ah, as if, just in case you don't have enough <laughs> in your life already. So why don't you go ahead and make yourself comfortable. I always encourage you to find a position that you can relax in. A lot of us, this is the hump day of Wednesday at the end of the day. And so you might feel like lying down. So I want to encourage you to do that if the body feels tired. You are not lesser than <laughs> if you lie down. It's one of the four positions taught by the Buddha. And uh, as well as with standing and walking and then seated, of course. So if you do want to lie down, what I recommend if you're a yogi or have taken yoga class, it's very much like Shavasana, the corpse pose at the end of a yoga class, where you lie on your back, if that's comfortable for you, with a little pillow under your head and a little blanket, rolled up blanket or a pillow under your knees, because that can be a nice way to release the low back. And so you want to make sure you're warm, you have a blanket or something over you. And the little trick to not fall asleep is to take one of your arms and just bend the elbow so that your forearm is perpendicular to the floor. Fingers are just gently pointing up to the sky. And what happens is it's just plumb line. So your arm, forearm is aligned with gravity. You don't have any tension in your shoulder to hold up the arm. It's just kind of propped, aligned with gravity, bones stacked on bones. And then what happens is if you start to fall asleep, the arm goes and it wakes you up. <laughs> and then you come back. Okay, because that's the pitfall of lying down is you can fall asleep, which you might need to do. So that's also a topic for discussion. Maybe you just let yourself drift off. That's okay. But if you know you're not that tired and you want to meditate, but you start to drift off, do the arm trick. And then leave your eyes slightly open, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the ceiling. Okay, everyone, good. Looks like you're settled in. Go ahead and allow the eyes to close to start as a turning inward. And take some deep breaths, releasing tension with the out breath. Feel the breath luxurious and smooth, like silky breath flowing in and out of the body, letting go of any tension or holding with each out breath. And I'll guide you through nine relaxation breaths, similar to what we do at the beginning of Feeding Your Demons. Simple nine-fold breath of the first three breaths. Breathe into any 
a, a physical tension in your body. Feel where you hold physical tension and then release it with the out breath. Feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension. Feel where you may be holding emotional tension in your body. Breathe into it, and then with the out breath, release that tension. Feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any mental tension, any worries or concerns. Feel where you're holding mental tension in your body. Breathe into it and then release with the out breath. Feel that tension melting deep, deep down into the earth beneath you. And now generate a heartfelt motivation to practice for the benefit of yourself and all beings. Now you can have your eyes either open or closed for this meditation as you wish. And sympathetic joy or mudita is the practice of opening to a quality of rejoicing, of joy, of celebration even, in the goodness of others as well as yourself, the well-being, the triumphs, the successes, as a way to counteract a self-centeredness, a competitiveness, a comparing mind, so that we train the mind whenever it starts to be comparing or competitive, in a sense, kind of retraining the neural pathways towards joy, towards rejoicing in the good fortune of others, as well as yourself. And so for this purpose, I invite you to bring to mind someone for whom it is easy to feel sympathetic joy a friend, a partner, family member, and imagine them in front of you. See them clearly. Even look into their eyes and get a sense of their body, their movement. <coughs> Maybe remembering how they looked the last time you saw them. Feel, see, sense them before you now in your mind's eye. And feel their joy. You can even see them in a moment of joy. Maybe they're just a joyful person or maybe there was a time that they were very happy. <clears throat> and see that joyfulness. And wish them well. And wish them even more joy. 
And have this feeling go out from your heart, like we do in the Donglen, sending this wish of joy and well-being from your heart. And feel in your body, in your mind, in your heart, feel joy in their joy. And see that joy increase. And really feeling the effect that this has on your body as well. And now see to the left of them a more neutral person, someone you don't really feel particularly competitive with or attached to. Maybe you see them in the street or in the neighborhood or in the market. Someone you don't know very well, a so-called neutral person. And see them as clearly as you can, really see the look in their eyes and so on. Maybe notice what they're wearing, maybe how they looked the last time you saw them. And notice how they're feeling and send them out this sympathetic joy, mudita, from the heart. Send them joy. You can even say a phrase like, may you have joy in your life or may you be well. And see any joy in their life and wish for that to increase. And see and sense that they become more and more joyful. And at the same time, <clears throat> feel your wish for their happiness to increase. Feel your wish for them to create the causes of happiness. Feel this deep heartfelt wish and see their joy increase more and more. And make a connection with their true nature and wish them that kind of joy. And feel how that feels in your body as well. And 
And then on the right side, see a difficult person in front of you in your mind's eye. This can be someone you have felt envious or jealous of, or someone whom you feel resentment towards. Perhaps you have a wish for them to be harmed or to lose what they have. Really see and sense this person in front of you now, to the right. Maybe you don't have someone you feel that way about currently, so it can be someone you have felt that way about in the past. And from the heart, as much as you can, offer them sympathetic joy. Even just for a moment, feel what that's like. You can always get your resentment back later, but just for the moment, let go and feel what it feels like to offer that wish, joy to increase in their life. And coordinate with the breath if that feels good for you. You can just breathe out this heartfelt wish, releasing any jealous feelings of them having joy and success, releasing the feeling that somehow their joy would give you less joy. Just letting this feeling of mudita, sympathetic joy, flow to them. And feel what this releases in you. And feel each of these three beings in front of you, your loved one in the middle, the neutral person to the left, and the so-called enemy to your right. Feel and see them in front of you and feel the mudita going to all of them at once from your heart. Feel the joy in their joy all at once. And then expand that out to all beings in this Zoom room, in this space, cyber dharma space together. And just intuiting that. flashing on everyone here and wish them joy. Imagining that they all light up with joy like light bulbs going on. And feel the expansiveness of your own heart and all of this being felt within the fabric of the interconnected web of our interbeing, the emptiness, the shunyata, 
interdependent fullness. Feel that heart, your heart expanding. And that recognition of our interconnectedness. And then expanding this out to all the beings within your home, around your home, the land around you, the little beings under the earth, and all the insects, birds, small beings above the ground, within the ground, and wishing for their well-being. freedom from fear, wish that they have what they need, feel all the animals large and small, expanding out to all the animals, the continent, the ocean, the lakes, the rivers, the sky, Sending sympathetic joy to all beings that are here that we don't necessarily see and wish for their well-being and happiness. And also now sending to all the people in your area, your home, your neighborhood, city, and beyond, your friends, family. Sending out to all the people you don't know. And see all of them light up with joy and see their joy increasing and expanding. And feel the interconnectedness with all those beings. Feel your inseparability from them our dependence on them, and our interdependence with them. And then expand that out beyond into this whole area, this state, neighboring states, our whole country, beyond our borders, Really make your mind vast enough to feel into all those beings. In this area of the world and wish for the happiness of all beings. Expanding to cover the whole earth and the inconceivable number of beings on the earth. Really, from the heart, wish that all beings be free from suffering and that they may create the causes of ultimate happiness and joy. And feel the wish for them to never be separated from the supreme joy that is beyond all sorrow. Really feel this immeasurable quality of sympathetic joy, mudita.
And then expand this out even beyond our planet to other possible beings in the universe. And feel the inconceivable size of the universe and send that wish out and feel how we really have to break down our own limits in order to feel this immeasurable sympathetic joy. It's really beyond the conceptual mind. And so at this point, we're just emanating it from our hearts. And then feel this immeasurable joy, even just a part of this joy, a fraction, a ray of it, and direct it back to yourself. Just bathing yourself in the wish that you too may experience the supreme joy that's beyond suffering and beyond the waves of samsara that deep sense of joy and wholeness, a feeling of coming home. Make that wish, may I too bask in that light. May I too taste the bliss of supreme joy of my true nature. Make an offering to yourself and receive that offering. And then just release any effort of any doing, any prayer, any visualization, just let it go and rest in your natural presence, free of striving or activity or working in any way. Feel yourself unwind into presence. a beingness, uh, being here with the breath in the body, and receiving the gifts of the joy practice, just resting in the moment. In the body, Releasing distraction with the out-breath. Just allow the mind to settle in its natural state. Just rest.
to close, we'll take a moment to dedicate any merit that's come about through this practice of sympathetic joy and really feel that as a, as a form of positive energy of merit and wish that this merit may spread to all beings without exception. Make this offering. May all beings benefit through this practice. May it become immeasurable, limitless, May it be so. Thank you. And now as we open our eyes, if they were closed, and normally if we were in a room, like on a retreat together, I'd invite you to um, look around the room with the eyes of Mudita. Maybe we can look around the Zoom room if you want to do that. If not, that's okay too. (laughs) But we are in a Zoom room. I could even turn on your video if you're willing to do that. And just let's look at the gallery view. And just really feel that interconnectedness that we're all, as Ram Dass said, we're all just walking each other home. (laughs) Yeah not separate. Really wishing joy for each other. I can feel it. I feel it. <laughs> you feel it? (laughs) Yeah. It's so cool to really, I've said this before, but this, the neutral person, I used to think was just such a throwaway (laughs) idea. Just silly. Because most people in the world are neutral to us. We don't know most people. And Even some of us, you know, we have little connections with each other, maybe more than a little connection with people in this Zoom room, but maybe a lot of us feel kind of like those neutral people. We don't, yeah, we share a sangha, but maybe we don't know each other. So to feel that sincere wish of may you have joy, may your joy increase, even to those we don't know is... Walking down the street's fun, especially if you live in the city and you walk a lot. That's a great way to... How many people practice like Lojong or Donglin, walking down the street? Yeah. (laughs) And the subway. Especially if somebody cuts you off driving, that's a good time to practice (laughs) too. Any questions or comments about this before we go into the slogan? Maybe we'll spend, you know, five, ten minutes max. Um, any questions, comments, sharing? You know, it was this was a guided visualization practice similar to Tonglen, but also different in that we're not really um, coordinating it with the breath necessarily, although I invited you to do that if, if it felt good for you. But how did it feel to imagine a loved one and then a neutral person and then the so-called enemy and then all of them at once sending the love to them? How did that feel for you? I'm curious, really. You could chat in too if you want. And if you don't want to say anything and you're in the zone, that's a okay. I feel joy for your positive states. Okay. All right. Okay, so if there's nothing wanting to come forward, then uh, I'll just uh, dive in here. 
Got a fun slogan today. It's uh, slogan number 35. And it is, don't try to be the fastest. Or another translation is, don't be competitive. <laughs> so now you can see why sympathetic joy might be a good antidote to competitiveness, to the slogan that we're talking about. So, of course, if you're running a race or trying to get a job, you want to do everything you can to win. I'm not, you know, they're not saying to not pursue your dreams or work hard to get what you want. Of course, you'll want to do that. But if we do this in other areas of our life, then we can kind of be hard to live with, right? So it's kind of a no-brainer. Sometimes these slogans are like, yeah, yeah, we, we know, we know. So I'll just tease it out a little bit more especially in the realm of dharma this kind of competitiveness uh, oh the teachers like me am i recognized for my gifts you know if that's that's valid part of ourselves but to to be driven by a sense of competitiveness especially in your spiritual practice is we just have to say it's kind of like missing the point <laughs> especially from a lojong perspective where Remember, the one-liner is Lojong helps us to decrease our self-cherishing and increase cherishing of others, right? So if we're stuck in competitiveness, who are we cherishing? <laughs> who are we cherishing more? Me. So if there's, if you just feel in right now, like maybe this isn't such a thing for you, but maybe it is. So let's feel into it, like really feel into it, like... Do you experience a lot of competitiveness with your friends, colleagues, partners, siblings? Do you compare yourself? This is a very subtle thing, too. Like, is your self worth kind of measured in comparison to others? Do you always have to win? I notice I have a little bit of that. Like, I want to be. I want to be the best. <laughs> It's better as I get older, you know, I can see it. And I'm like, that's not going to make me happy. And then with practice, it's like, oh, I'm so glad that person is getting getting the attention or the accolades. Or It feels good to be able to do that. It's like getting older is better in some ways, right? Because these things come a little more easier. My 12-year-old super competitive. I don't know if he could really, really do this authentically yet <laughs> but rejoicing in the success of others this is the key antidote to being competitive or wanting to be fastest or best it's hard to be a good friend if you're always competitive or comparing yourself i've had friendships where even though there's a lot of love and goodwill and care there's always a little comparing you know it's kind of sticky not as much fun, right? <laughs> so this is this aspect of Dharma practice of cultivating sympathetic joy is really highlighted in this slogan. As I mentioned before, it's one of the four measurables. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, kind of later Mahayana, this list of four gets called the four measurables. Um, love, compassion, equanimity, and joy earlier teachings you might have heard these spoken of in terms of the four divine abodes the brahma viharas and literally what, what i've learned is that in earlier interpretations literally people thought the monastics the teachers thought that you would literally go to a place that was all love or literally go to an abode that was all compassion but then as refinement happened. You know, I don't know if this goes back to what the Buddha said or not, but later it was understood as states of mind, which, you know, for me as a Westerner makes a lot more sense. But these are divine abodes. The Brahma means divine or God. Vihara means abode. Vihara was the name or is the name for like Buddhist communities, like monasteries or towns or communities of spiritual practitioners. Vihara. 
Brahma Vihara is the divine place, divine abode. And these are states of mind, I think, that we can really understand them in that way. And sympathetic joy, in particular, counteracts jealousy, competitiveness. Did, were you able to feel that a little bit with the people you worked with in your visualization? A little loosening, a little opening? Uh, maybe a, a, like an aha moment of like, oh, wow, doing that is not, doesn't make me feel good. Maybe you felt a little release, uh, a little sense of something fresh, a new way to feel. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing some chats come in. Good, let's, um, let's see what that is. Uh, Suzanne says, no, there's something above. Claudia, it felt really good when you asked us to visualize the three people, and then when you said, imagine light bulbs going on. Uh, on the Zoom with the Sangha, it felt really good. Oh, my heart tickles a little bit with reading that. Yeah, the light bulb image was helpful for me too. Yeah, and to first really feel it in the people in the room, and this is our kind of psychic room, right? And then Suzanne says, I sometimes get stuck in comparing myself to others and feeling not good enough. And then trying to prove to myself I am by overdoing it all. Oh, welcome to the club, Suzanne. Mudita practice really helps with this. That's right. That's right. So good. It's just so liberating in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Who knows? Maybe comparing is kind of a biological thing, too. You know, maybe we're wired to do that for survival. So that's cool. Make a bow to it. <laughs> I see you, Mara. But I'm going to choose a different path. <laughs> That's what's cool about, you know, having our prefrontal cortex and this developed big brain is that we can notice the knee-jerk reactions, the instinct, in a sense, maybe the biological impulse. Not always, of course, because that's a very fine t thing. But often we can train ourselves to notice it and make another choice. So here's, a, here's an example of that. And so just one, just the highlight of this slogan is that this competitiveness is especially problematic when it comes to Dharma. You know, if you bring that to the cushion, oh, ay, ay, ay. You're going to be spending a lot of time on your cushion, <laughs> you know. The whole point of Dharma is to work on, on our self-importance, yeah? Now, of course, that doesn't mean we, in Dharma practice, we're not developing a, a healthy sense of self and ego. That's very important. Like, I am Chandra. Here's what I feel and what I need and what I don't want. Thank you. Here are my boundaries. You know, like, all of that is really important. But that's not an imbalance of self-importance, right? where I'm always kind of narcissistically fixated on me, me, me. Everything's about me, me, me. That's what we're talking about here. You know, being competitive in the race to enlightenment is like an oxymoron. <laughs> I'm missing the point. It's hard to feel peace if we're doing that. And one really beautiful commentary pointed to that when we understand through meditation and contemplation and learning and discussion like we do in these classes, when we begin to understand how our own mind works, in this case it can get competitive because maybe I don't feel good enough because I have a, maybe there were certain patterns in my family that perpetuated those feelings. So by understanding our own minds, why we do these things, why we feel these way, how the mind can get fixated on patterns and problems and so on, that is the doorway to wisdom. That this is not a problem, actually. Competitiveness is not a problem. It's a doorway. It's a mindfulness bell, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, to open into wisdom to do our practice. There are opportunities, right? We don't have problems. There are no mistakes. 
We have opportunities to practice. These are gateways to wisdom. So often competitiveness and wanting to be first, wanting to be the best, is coming from a very, very core issue that the Buddha taught that is really like at the root of our suffering, which is craving. We crave. We crave bliss. We crave feeling good. We crave recognition. We crave fame. Whatever it is we might be craving, this word... um, I'll just give you both. In Sanskrit is a little bit of a mouthful, but I'll paste it here in the chat. It's Trishna. <laughs> T-R-S-N-A. Trishna or Trishna. In Sanskrit, sometimes the R can be a vowel. And in Tibetan, it's Sepa which is hard to read in Wiley. This like you'd never really be able to, what, what's that? It looks like Sredpa, but the Tibetans pronounce it as Sepa. So you could say like Sepa. It sounds like that, Sepa. So this is a very kind of classic technical term that's good to know because it really talks, it really pinpoints kind of the crux. It is also translated as thirst, thirst. So it's this, this kind of eternal thirst for stimulation, right? Again, kind of a biological thing. So literally means thirst, often translated also as craving. And literally, it is a desire not to be separate from pleasure and to be free from pain. So we want pleasure and we don't want pain. And that's the craving. We crave pleasure and we crave not to have pain. (laughs) We thirst for pleasure and we thirst to be free of displeasure. It's the 12th, it's the ninth in the 12 nidanas, these kind of interconnected links of dependent origination. It's a whole other topic. I can imagine uh, MC Owens going into a really wonderful diagram (laughs) of the 12 links. He's probably done it a million times. You know, we could have a whole class on that. We won't go into it now. But it's just how the Buddha highlighted the ways we get stuck in samsara and we cycle again and again and again. It's, you know, becoming and craving and attachment and name and form and how we perceive birth, old age, sickness and death. It's this whole like 12 step link of dependent origination. So craving is actually the ninth. (laughs) Trishna is the ninth. So you could say that Trishna is like we're craving, we're craving, uh, we want and don't want. We do this kind of like push and pull classically around the eight mundane concerns which I've mentioned a lot in this class and it's all they're always interesting to think about because I think we can all identify with these I've pasted them there it's gain and loss so we want gain we don't want loss fame and insignificance so we maybe not everybody but this is general you want fame you don't want to be insignificant Praise and blame. We want praise. We don't want to be blamed. We want happiness. We don't want suffering. So Trishna comes into play really clearly with these eight mundane concerns. And I'm sure we can make up a bunch of other concerns (laughs) too, couldn't we? Um, So really to define sympathetic joy, it's simply rejoicing in the good fortune of others. So that's the classic definition of sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the good fortune of others. Walt says, I constantly reflect on shortcomings in my thoughts and actions in living, and I complete, and I compete with myself to do better. (laughs) That's all right. sort of you know yeah 
just as long as I guess we do, we uh, give some love to that other part of your, ourselves that we're competing against in terms of not objectifying it too much. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, we do have these certain, you know, the mind can understand itself. It's that awareness of thoughts, that capacity where we can be like, oh, I'm aware of my negative thinking again. I can do better. Maybe let's cultivate positive states or do something that feels beneficial, right? So in a way, I think what, you, what you're saying here is, is a good function of, of the mind too, that self-reflection. It's really called introspection, you know, and that's a practice in, of meditation. It's mindfulness and introspection, two very important tools to bring to your meditation cushion, whether it's shamatha, vipassana, mantra, anything. It's okay. What, what, the, what the, my teachers often say is about 85% of your awareness is kind of mindfulness. So you're about 85% kind of imbued with the quality of mindful awareness, remembering. Mindfulness is a translation of a word called sati, which means literally to remember. So you're remembering. Whether you're on the cushion or out and about in the world, you're remembering to be mindful, to come be in the moment and to be present with what's happening. And then about 15% on um, is introspective. It's that kind of the checking in from time to time. How am I doing? Oh, am I in my critical mind again? There I am. Ding. Bow. Oh, teacher. Or, oh, Mara, I see you. Or if you like labeling, label it. Or if you have a magic wand, you can <laughs> transform it into a bunny rabbit. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm noticing I'm caught in a lot of projections or hopes and fears about future stuff, I see them as like little soapy bubbles, you know, bubbles floating. And I just go. <laughs> so whatever you need to do, do it. But that's the quality of introspection. It's like, I see you. Okay, I'm going to release and open back into mindfulness. So... Lindsay says, I felt a lessening of energy toward my difficult person, a move toward more ne neutral, but humbling to realize how much easier it was to direct sympathetic joy to inside. <laughs> Good one. I like that one, Lindsay. That's funny. Yes. That's impressive. <laughs> Mosquitoes? <laughs> I didn't think about mosquitoes. Um, I, didn't, I also didn't think about ticks, but... I mean, I, I noticed that in the practice, I was sort of criticizing myself. I was like, you're doing a really shitty job, um, extending sympathetic joy to this person. And then, um, I just sort of rested and you said something like notice what's being freed up. And then I, I sort of got critical, like nothing, nothing's getting freed up. But then I felt, um, like actually just less energy is, is good. It doesn't have to be, it's not a sort of the radical transformation is that it's just a little less sharp. Yeah. Nice. It's wonderful. Can I also add, I, yeah. I actually also ended up um, when we went over the, the little beings around us and in the soil and everything. And I, mm. I started um, thinking about all the little uh, bugs on my eyelashes and my eyebrows and who knows where on my body little dinosaurs and, uh, yeah yeah and um and i was just thinking you know and then i had a thought what about the ones that are trying to kill me and then yeah even to those you know even <laughs> may they also be happy <laughs> okay. even covid virus corona 19 mm -hmm. The, the idea in, the, in a lot of these practices, thank you, Ramit, that's great. And it brings to mind this kind of alchemical practice that we do in Tonglen, but it's also in some other tantric practices like Chud, uh, where we feed the demon to complete satisfaction, like feeding your demons. And it doesn't make these viruses or these so-called demons bigger. It actually satiates them so they leave you alone. <laughs> because what they're trying to do you know, whether it's energetic thought patterns or habits or people or bugs, it's like they're, they're feeding. 
right, off of our energy, metaphorically maybe. But that can, so if you turn that and feed, feed your attention, feed your well-wishing, your mudita or your nectar or whatever you're doing, what practice you're doing, it, it satisfies. So even with viruses or cancers or HIV AIDS or we can imagine like if we send them love, it doesn't mean they're going to get bigger and scarier and more deadly. In fact, they get satisfied to complete satisfaction then they no longer wreak havoc. That's the whole uh, chemical shamanic understanding of how we work with these things. So thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so Walt says, the old 12-step adage, if you spend too much time inside your own head, you'll get trapped behind enemy lines. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. That's funny. Like Moana. Does she say that too? <laughs> or like, oh right, like the... Is that what happened at the end, that big battle? And yeah, it's been a while. That was a good movie. Well, good. I think that happens at the end of the Avatar, too, the series. Not the movie, but the CS series. How many people are Avatar fans? It's got to be one of the best animated series ever, even for adults. Avatar. The ending is very much like feeding your demons, also. Okay, so I want to just spend a little time also on the four immeasurables because it's so bedrock to what we're doing with, uh, with Lojong, with Donglen, with Dharma. So Buddhists love lists, so get ready. Hopefully you'll feel this list as a warm, fuzzy list. <laughs> so what are we primarily cultivating in dharma practice in our meditation in lo jong for example mind training as i said earlier is reducing that kind of small sense of self that we fixate on me 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 and increase the kind of like the attention the cherishing of others around us like opening the heart more that's classic and what this is is bodhicitta right bodhicitta so bodhicitta, I think a lot of us know this word already, but if you don't, here it is. Bodhi, the Sanskrit word, means awakening or awakened. Chitta means heart-mind. It's in, in Indian philosophy, the mind, heart-mind is at the heart chakra. It's not just in the brain. It's actually the, the nexus, the plexus of consciousness is actually in the heart chakra, not the actual beating heart. It's a subtle body anatomy. <laughs> and so chitta is the mind or the heart mind of awakening. And what that is, is it's imbued, it's imbued with compassion. So this is a very important word. Uh, and me in beyond the word, the feeling, the meaning is utterly important in Dharma. And in the classic teachings, they teach that this bodhicitta has some different aspects to it. Most notably, you have a relative level bodhicitta and an absolute or ultimate level bodhicitta. Right? So there are two main baskets of bodhicitta. Relative level bodhicitta is compassion practices. It's generating this heartfelt aspiration to be of benefit in the world. It's really, you know, love and compassion. And there are various techniques that we engage in to cultivate that if we need to. <laughs> if it comes naturally, that's fine. Great. The other basket is the ultimate basket, and that is absolute dimension, shunyata, dharmakaya, uh, your own Buddha nature. It is Shunyata in the sense of the interconnected, empty fullness of the vibratory fabric of reality and our consciousness and who we are, you are, we're all connected, we're not separate. And it's that realization of that shunyata, of the empty fullness of everything, that is the ultimate truth, which is ultimate bodhicitta, which is imbued with love. It's not sterile empty in terms of a cold, dark place. It's actually warm and fuzzy emptiness. <laughs> and 
And so we have relative level bodhicitta, which is compassion, and absolute level bodhicitta, which is emptiness. Shunyata. I think, Claudia, I think you're unmuted. I'm not mis- I'm hearing a little bit. So, um, I'm just going to mute. Yeah. So, if you are an outline drawer or imaginer, then you will enjoy that in the basket of relative level bodhicitta, you have two parts. Aspirational bodhicitta and action bodhicitta. Aspirational bodhicitta consists of, guess what? The four immeasurables. So these are practices that we do in meditation and in our life as a wish, an aspiration to grow these qualities in us, which are all aspects or facets of bodhicitta. So love, compassion, equanimity, joy. These four things are these four immeasurables, which we did the one of. We did the joy one tonight. So these are called the aspirational bodhicitta practices of the four immeasurables. Clear? You with me? The bodhicitta in action practices are also another familiar thing that you've probably heard before, but maybe you didn't know it was in this kind of basket, which are the six perfections. The uh, paramitas. The six perfections are generosity. That's the first one. These are practices that we enact. This is bodhicitta in action. We give. That's dana. Generosity is dana. The second is like ethical discipline. You know, we do the right thing. You know, we don't harm others. We don't lie. We don't cheat. We don't steal. We don't engage in sexual misconduct. We don't get intoxicated to the point where we lose our faculties. Basic ethics. The third is patience, cultivating a, a quality of kind of like calm, patient, slow it down. So patience is the third. The fourth is enthusiastic effort or diligence. So we, we apply some effort in our spiritual path. The fifth is concentration our meditative stability, so we're kind of cultivating stability of the mind, concentration. And the sixth is wisdom. Wisdom. I can direct you towards books, too, that have all this stuff. So I've taught this so many times. I've got a memory. I can do it in my sleep. <laughs> Lizzle's taking notes. So... Those are the six perfections, and wisdom, the last one, is what makes all the prior five perfect, or perfections. <laughs> Why is that? Because wisdom is the direct perception of your own true nature, which is empty of intrinsic existence, meaning you are not separate. You're not an independent, intrinsically existing little pod over here that's separate from everything else. And when you have a direct perception of that kind of bliss emptiness, then you're home. And then that imbues all your other actions. So when you give in generosity, you're not giving out of a small mind, you're giving out of a big mind heart. If you're patient or diligent or disciplined, you're doing it out of this wisdom. And therefore, they all become paramitas. It's said because wisdom is understanding what's called a threefold emptiness. The emptiness of the, the doer, like the subject. The emptiness of the object or the receiver. And then the emptiness of the action in between. Or sometimes you could say of the thing given or the thing done. 
the threefold emptiness of uh, subject, object, and the action in between. That those are all interdependent, co-arising events or occurrences. None of them exist in and of themselves, independent of other things, of the other. So if you have that direct kind of, not just intellectual, but feeling that in your body, oh wow, my thoughts, my actions, my words, everything is a, 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 an arising, impermanent, kind of co-arising, dependently related event, which is what my <laughs> mentor, Alan Wallace, used to always say, he still says it classic translation of Buddhist terms of like these tendang drawar ki jungpa, these events, these moment to moment arisings are all interconnected. They're not separate, static, permanent things. Okay, so that's wisdom. And if we can bring that into our giving, then we're not so attached to the outcome of our giving. If we can bring that into our discipline, then we're not so rigid in our discipline, if we can bring that into our patience, then we have more spaciousness and understanding in our practice of patience. patience. And the same can be applied to uh, diligence and concentration, the other six, the other of the six. So um, these are all, the four immeasurables and the six perfections are all in the basket of relative bodhicitta practices. Relative bodhicitta practices. This is the path of the bodhisattva. How many people did the book study group with Eve a year ago or so, or two years ago, on the way of the bodhisattva? Did anybody do that? Yeah, Claudia was there, Gina, maybe Suzanne, and yeah, Karen. So these are familiar, right? You studied these. You studied the six perfections, and sometimes there are ten perfections. But we won't go into those. Six perfections are the most common. Okay? So that's the basket of relative bodhicitta that has the aspirational bodhicitta of the four immeasurables and the action bodhicitta practices of the six perfections. That other basket is a bit lighter. <laughs> That's the absolute bodhicitta basket. And that has the wisdom. That is the wisdom practice. So it's the wisdom. The sixth of the paramitas is a bridge into absolute bodhicitta. It's the wisdom that sees into the empty nature of your own mind, the empty nature of phenomenon, and it's a very liberating experience. It's like it's like the illusion of the container cracks open and you recognize that the in, inner space and the outer space are not separate. The inner space and the outer space are not separate. Oneness, you could say, non-dual, consciousness, rigpa, your own pristine awareness. This is shunyata. And this is the Great Mother, Prajnaparamita. What does Prajnaparamita mean? It means perfection of wisdom. It's the sixth of the perfections. It's also the name for the Great Mother. Why? <laughs> because she is the womb of totality, the genetrix of the awakened state. She's called the mother of the Buddhas because all beings must pass through her, must gestate and birth through her, this realization of emptiness, to become fully realized, to become awakened. You must pass through the direct perception of emptiness in order to be free of the shackles of your own karmas that keep you bound. It's so beautiful. These teachings are just so profound. And so loving kindness sits within this larger map of the path of the bodhisattva. And so I hope that that gives you a, an appreciation for this. It's like, okay, we're kind of myopically kind of like honing in, not in a bad way, but like just focusing in on specific practices. But it's good 
to pan out and to see the bigger map so that you understand, oh, this is where I'm going. These are tried and tested practices for getting free, free of fixation, free of solidity, free of those thought patterns that keep us, keep us down. Leanne, the genetrix of, of the totality of being. What a business card. Yeah. <laughs> the genetrix of the awakened state, you could say. Yeah, Tanya says, emptiness helps me with not clinging so much. So genetrix is such a great word, isn't it, Leanne? Genetrix it's, has its root in the word gyno, the womb. to generate. It's like to give birth. So the genetrix is, is one who births. And so I'm not talking about some great mother up in the sky. It's your own consciousness. It's, it's, the word is dharmakaya, which means the, the dimension of truth, the absolute dimension. Dharma is truth or uh, suchness, kaya is dimension or body. So dharmakaya is that absolute dimension, the great mother. Yeah, an easily digestible book on these great, on these beautiful principles. Well, the classic one that might not be so easily digestible, but it is a real great one to know and to have in your library is Treasury of Precious Qualities. Treasured Precious Qualities. Um, Alan Wallace has a great, wonderful book um, on the four immeasurables called Genuine Happiness. Pamela, do you have any recommendations? I would say do definitely do the way of the bodhisattva. Sharon Salzberg has that book. The loving kindness book is yeah, great. Yeah, loving kindness, but it's only on, I think it's just on the four measurables, but that's like really straightforward. I think it's even just on loving kindness, right? Does she talk no, about she the goes other three? All of them. Yeah, she does. Oh, good. Yeah. That's a great book. I don't know if I'm spelling her last name right. She's great. Sandra, yeah. could you, could you, um, I mean, aside from the Dalai Lama, has anybody achieved wisdom and this absolute bodhicitta? Because it seems like such a tall order. <laughs> While you were going through that, I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, what is it that we have to do to get there? Or, or is the goal yeah. just the path? You know, I mean, it's just, quite honestly, it wasn't very comprehensible to me. I, I find it very, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, it, it's hard to put it. I like some more down to earth, relevant examples in everyday life of like, how can we go through these? I mean, I understand the going through the, the parameters, but I mean, can we ever even aspire or <laughs> believe that in our lifetime we would be able to achieve wisdom? I don't know. It just seems too complex. Too. The word wisdom literally is uh, like a deep knowing. And so you have wisdom in you already. And it's really like an unwinding or an undoing of the, the confusion that comes uh, from feeling separate, right? So you're already there. You know, yeah, you, some people could say, you know, these are just, you know, the monastics had too much time on their hands <laughs> and they were <laughs> making lists and, oh my God, it's exhausting. But it's also a really, I mean, over the years, what I find is that it's beautiful to have an architecture, to have a structure or a house within which these kind of nonverbal experiences can live. So, you know, these lists, these kind of things give you a little structure of understanding, oh, this is the path. 
So I cultivate these different qualities and and then I feel more joy and fulfillment in my life. And then when I'm out in the world, oh yeah, I shouldn't be stingy, you know. I practice generosity. You know, they're just like signposts. And wisdom, I mean, I would posit, Claudia, that you already n- know prajna. Maybe you're not steeping like me, you know, maybe all of us are like this, but like like me, you might not always be s- in that state, but you've probably tasted experiences of like, oh, I'm not separate, or that kind of pleasure or bliss that comes from really sinking deep into your innermost essence. That's another way of describing. That's another way of feeling into it. All of these are just like fingers pointing at the moon. So definitely um, maybe didn't want to make you so intimidated where you felt like, I'm never going to get that. But also have a sense of reverence for this beautiful tradition where, you know, like Westerners have put so much time into developing I mean, and and other cultures too, not just Westerners, but this kind of scientific materialism is so strong in our culture, and there's so much energy that's gone towards solving those problems, which have, has been fabulous and important. But in the same way, these other cultures like India, Tibet, China, and other South Southeast Asia, and so on, Iran, and other cultures have put so much time and effort into understanding and mapping the science of the mind, right? So as a as reverence, I think it's important for us to at least make an effort to learn a little bit about that map so we really grok the depth of what has come before. And it does help with our faith. Somebody said that Sharon has faith. And um and I she has faith because she's been in it, you know. And When we learn, it develops confidence, and with confidence comes that faith. So, and anyway, I know that sometimes. Thank you for explaining because I, I I agree now. I mean, it seemed, I'm glad that you explained about the w- wisdom being feeling the oneness or the non separation, mm, yeah, the connection with yeah. others. That makes more sense to me. So, good, yeah, and I have definitely felt that. So. Thank you. Yeah. Claudia, thanks for your question. You know, they, there's an old saying, teachers are like a drum. You need to bang on them to get them to resound. <laughs> you know, so you banged on me. You asked me a question. Questions are like, bang. You didn't really f- speak to me on that one. Can you try again? <laughs> you had to bang on the drum. Yeah. Anyone else? We've got a couple minutes. I'm not going to be with you for a while. So that's why I also gave you a big fat download. <laughs> I, did, I just felt like, oh, I want to share with them. So um, I, I'm i going on a retreat for a few weeks. I'm going to do some writing and teaching. And uh, so Eve will be here next week. And I think then the following week. And then later in April, um, a dear friend and colleague of mine, Jeff Tip, will be subbing. And he'll guide Feeding Your Demons. So it's that last Wednesday of the month of April. He'll do Feeding Your Demons. He's an amazing practitioner, a therapist, and a very experienced teacher. He's a Zen teacher, too. And so he'll come and and share. I'll be back in mid-May. So it's been fun to be here with you tonight. I wanted to just announce that before I forgot. Is there anyone else, any burning comment or question that wants to come through? Yeah, Keegan. Um, Yeah, I'm wondering if you could share about how to work skillfully with remorse. I think I like had actually had an experience with competitiveness earlier this week and it was it was rooted I was actually filling out a retreat application and I was like um the retreat is very important to me and it's a longer one because I'm having like health issues right now and so um, I was kind of like already in fear when I was filling it out and 
and I was sort of dishonest and, and I realized after I was dishonest in my intentions and, and putting some of the things down that I did, it was like almost like I, um, yeah, I think I was exaggerating without realizing it. Mm -hmm. It was almost like I was trying to fill it out like a resume uh, and I uh, woke up like sick, you know, the next day. I just like, um, it just, it, it, it felt a lot different in a dharmic context for me and I, um, it's really easy right now for the remorse to like kind of go into shame and, and self-hatred and so yeah. Um, yeah thank you it's so good to to lay it bare isn't it it's, i really value and appreciate you bringing that to the space and in a way it's it's a part of that kind of working with our remorse is to lay it bare, you know, share it with a teacher, share it with a sangha, share it and open and feel the humanity in that. And um, one thing that I've learned with the, the racial justice work is that guilt, especially as a white body person in this lifetime, um, the guilt and the shame that I might feel around something like, you know, my uh, white bodied advantages and the privileges that I hold and all of that, what, what, the, my mentors have said is that the guilt or remorse is a good thing. It's a good thing, but it shouldn't be your end point. It's a, let it be a bridge. Let it be a bridge to then like, what's next? Okay, what can I do? Oh, I didn't feel, I didn't sleep well on that. It made me feel sick the next day. What can I do with that? The remorse is telling me something. Oh, I can go back and correct that, or I can set it right somehow. What would feel good in my body? What could I live with? So let that remorse, let the guilt or the shame be not the end point, but a bridge for the next move. Okay? Right? So that's, that's again, that's a gift. It's that gateway to wisdom. Right? And then it doesn't eat you up. Then it's not festering. But it's, you've used it as a springboard. It served its purpose, and then you can let it go. Thank you. Yeah. But your mindfulness and introspection helped you understand that. That's you understanding the workings of your own mind. When I tell little white lies, when I exaggerate, I tell you funny stories. His Holiness the Dalai Lama was giving uh, Kala Chakra teachings. This was when I was living in India. I was young, my early 20s. And he was teaching on ethics, and he said, and lying, and not lying was one of the vows, you know, there are the five main lay vows you could take. Not lying, not stealing, um, not killing, no sexual misconduct, and no intoxication. So he's talking about each one, and he said, you know, exaggeration is a form of lying. And I had never thought of it that way, and I, I, I realized I exaggerate so much in my life. <laughs> Why do we exaggerate? Well, I knew I exaggerated because I didn't feel like it was enough or I was enough. Right? Someone else said that earlier. I don't know if it was Suzanne or, you know, we do these things because we feel like we're not enough. I need to exaggerate. I need to be more than what I am. But when I could see that through the lens of like, oh, that's just another more surreptitious way of lying. Okay, I should, I don't need to do that. And then what would it feel like to be enough as you are? Keegan, like you're in, like, how would it be to be like, this is me. If you want me, great. If not, fine. But if we get into a program uh, by lying or we apply for a job and we make ourselves like I just applied to a bunch of grad schools, by the way. And I, I found my impulse to make myself seem better than I really was. <laughs> And my friend gave me the best advice. He's like, just be 100% yourself. Because if they don't want you, they're lost. But if you get in pretending to be what you're not, it's going to be hell. <laughs> so we have to think in those ways, you know. Like, oh, I just want to be my, you know, like be, I'm okay with who I am. But I hope that's helpful. That was kind of more, but... I think stories can be helpful with these types of feelings, yeah. It is. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, 
I should let you go. Karen says, I haven't read Faith, though I've heard Sharon explain Faith as the antidote to greed and was wondering if you could clarify this more for me. Faith is an antidote to greed. Yeah, maybe it's a little too late for that. That's a good, maybe you could pop that question, I don't know if it feels like it's in the flow with Eve. Maybe she could tackle that one. Because I, like off the top of my head at my 9, 9.05 p.m. brain, <laughs> I'm not getting a clear correlation. So, and that is enough, <laughs> right? <laughs> an antidote to fear, maybe. Interesting, yeah. Faith is an antidote to everything. Maybe. At least in, in Buddhism, they, the faith plays a very important role. But we can't just... F- paste it on, you know, like the four thoughts that turn the mind towards the Dharma help to cultivate faith. And that's in the first slogan, right? First practice the preliminary. Confidence and faith come together too. Okay. All right, my friends, thank you and have a beautiful evening and have a lovely week and Eve will be with you next Wednesday. Thanks, Pam. Mm, have such a great retreat, Chandra. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chandra. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Best of luck. You, also in your graduate school applications. Oh my God. Oh, no. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> you need us to be a recommendation. One of me that thinks I'm not enough wants to go back to school. No, I'm kidding. I'm checking that part. I'm checking that part. Make sure they know about Wednesday night. Like, you can't do homework. Yeah, can't do Wednesday nights. <laughs> 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 All of them. <laughs>